Welcome to Bio 110. Today we're going to have a lecture on microscopy. I will advance each slide uh, so you know when I have finished narrating one slide after seeing after saying excuse me next next slide. What is a cell? Cells are the fundamental units of life. The most simple organisms are single cell organisms. Think about the bacteria, think about an amoeba. But cells are also part of multicellular organisms, and as part of multicellular organisms, cells can be part of tissues. Tissues tend to be the building blocks of organs, and organs can build up the entire organism. So our living cells are derived from a ancestor cell, that is the cell theory of development, and which in the indicates that uh, an existing cell will come from a previously existing cell. Next slide. So cells come in very different morphologies. We can have small, um, small um, bacillus-like cells, like the ones shown here uh, in bacteria. We can also have small colonies of cells, like the volvox. Red blood cells, um, their function is directly related to their function, their donut shape. Neurons also are directly, its functions are directly related to its uh, structure. So one cell nucleus with a long axon followed by dendrites. Intestinal cells will form a tissue with crypts and, and, vila, and villus, and as well as plants tissue will be composed of multiple cells to give that plant structure and stability. So when we look at biological systems, we have to look at the different scales in which biological systems develop. We have um, large organisms like people, cats, dogs, we do not require a microscope or aid to be able to see them. We can see them with the naked eye. However, after about one millimeter, creatures are too small for us to discern them with the naked eye. And that's when we require the help of microscopes. So if we want to see a eukaryotic cell, like an amoeba, and we're looking at it, we can use a light microscope to see it. But that will not help us to discern the organelles present inside that amoeba cell. Neither would be, a, neither would be able to see bacteria. They are too small for our eyes to see. So we can use different light microscopes to be able to appreciate those cells. But then, um, there are small bacteria, there are viruses, and those cannot be resolved with the power of light microscopy. At that point, what we can use is an electron microscope that is going to allow us to have the resolution to be able to see the structures within a virus or the very fine structures within a cell, like the nucleus, the proteins, the lipids, and small molecules. Next slide. So we can look at different types of microscopes. And what we're going to see is that we can use light microscopes that, as the name implies, they're going to use light as the energy to visualize the specimen. A type of uh, light microscope that is very important in biology, it is the fluorescence microscope. And then um, we can also use the electron microscope either for transmittance or for scanning electron microscopy to let us get an idea about gross structures within a very small um, sample or very fine ultra level of structures within, for example, a cell. Next slide. So when we think about microscopes, all of them have principles that they have in common. They all require a source of illumination. In the light microscope, that will be a light bulb or a laser. In the case of the electron microscope, that will be a uh, electron beam. So we have a specimen that we want to see. This will be cells that could be alive if we want to see them in a light microscope. 
or a tissue that has been treated and fixed to be viewed in the electron microscopes. But also, that light needs to be focused to create the visual image. So both the electron microscope and the light microscope use lenses to be able to focus the image. So all those three elements are required for microscopy. So what does a microscope do? A microscope detects, magnifies, and resolves very small objects. The nature of the image that you're going to obtain with the microscope is going to the temp of the type of microscopy that you use and the type of specimen preparation used to prepare the sample. And we're going to take some time to look into this in future slides. Next slide. So some important terms about microscopy. First, resolution. It is the ability of the microscope to distinguish between two closely positioned objects. Imagine having two very small spheres next to one another. Is that microscope able to tell you that they are two independent objects or do you see them as one object? The next part of this is absorption. When light passes through an object, the intensity of that light is reduced depending on the color absorbed. Thus, the selective absorption of white light produces color light, and we're going to be taking advantage of that to increase contrast with the work of dyes. Refraction. It's the change of direction of a ray of light passing from one transparent medium to another different medium that has a different optical density. And we're going to spend some time looking at the refraction index and how that is used to increase contrast. The next part is going to be the diffraction. And the diffraction, the diffraction is going to be the light rays bent around edges and how those the bending of that light around the edges, it's going to affect the image that is produced by the microscope. And last but not least, you have dispersion. Dispersion is the capacity of uh, a microscope to separate light into constituent wavelengths when entering a transparent medium. Think of a prism. So when you have white light that is going through a prism, at the other end, the light is dispersed and you get a rainbow the change in refraction index with wavelengths, such as the spectrum produced by a prism or a rainbow, is a perfect example of dispersion. Next slide. So let's talk about the light microscope, which is one of the most uh, commonly used microscopes in biological research. The resolution or the resolving power of the light microscope is between 200 nanometers to 0 0.1 millimeters. So keep in mind, when you come to class, would a light microscope be able to resolve two spheres that are 300 nanometers away from each other? Would it be able to resolve, resolve two spheres which are 200 nanometers from one another? And would it be able to resolve two spheres that are 150 nanometers from one another? Think about that question for lecture. Microscopes used in biology uh, are usually called bright field microscopes. That is because they have um, great flooding of light into the specimens. They're also compound microscopes, meaning that they have an objective as well as an ocular lens. So the magnification of the uh, specimen happens at the objective part and at the ocular piece. So a bright field microscope is going to have a light source and the light source is going to provide the illumination for the specimen. The light is going to be focused towards the specimen using a special condenser lens that is able to bend the light produced by the illumination light source and focus it into the specimen. And after that, the objective lens is able to then collect the light that has been uh, passed through the specimen and will be able to magnify it.
not shown in the image, are prisms that are able to bend the light rays that come from the objective into the ocular lens. And at the ocular lens, you have a re-magnification of the specimen and that allows the visualization of the entire specimen. So think, for example, of the magnification that happens with a compound microscope. Usually, an ocular piece is going to have a 10x magnification. The objective lens is going to have magnifications from 4x, 10x, 40x, or 100x in the case of the oil immersion. The total magnification of the microscope will be the combination of the ocular as well as the objective piece. Next slide. What we also have is the addition, is the idea, excuse me, of refraction. And refraction, as we talk about, is the bending of light and the resultant colors that separate or are dispersed by, in this case, a prism. So the short waves are bent more than the longer waves. So the red um, light is less refracted versus the violet light that is mostly refracted. We also talk about the fact that we have refraction index. The refractive index, it's going to be the um, product of the division of the velocity of light in a specific medium, like the cytoplasm of the cell, divided by the velocity of light as it passes through air. So rays of light passing through a specimen that has a very different uh, viscous material are going to travel at a different speed than when they travel to air. Think about the cytoplasm. It has proteins, it has lipids, it has um, sugars. All those macromolecules present in the cytoplasm and all the structures present in the cell are going to change the velocity of light compared to the light velocity in air. So, an unstained life cell can sometimes be visualized if we uh, look and exploit the thickness and refractive indexes of different parts of the cell. And that's what we're going to talk about in the next slide when we look at phase contrast. So, in this slide we're going to explore the um, advantages of phase contrast microscopy. So we have two different images here in this slide. These are fibroblasts who have been, uh, that are being seen through a light microscope. In the left side, you have the fibroblasts being seen through bright field microscopy. So now, and in the right hand, you have the same cells now being seen through phase contrast microscopy which takes advantage of the reflective, refractive index differences between the cells and their surrounding medium. So light rates that are directed into the specimen from the life source and the condenser lens are going to pass through. But the speed at which the light passes through the cell differs from the speed of which the light is passing through the surrounding medium because the cell has a different refractive index. So you create a speed phase, a change in the wavelength of light. So phase contrast microscopy converts the difference in light speeds, or phase, to alterations in brightness, and those alterations in brightness result in contrast. And you can uh, are able then to see it, uh, see the cells, in much better ways. So take a look at the same sample to the right. You can see the delineation of the membrane a lot better. You can see uh, where the small partitions of the membrane are. And the sample, it has a lot more sharpness and contrast. Next slide. Bright field illumination has some limitations. The first is that Bright field illumination does not reveal differences in brightness between structural details. 
because there is no contrast. The cell cannot be distinguished from its nucleus. You only see a silhouette of the cell with bright field microscopy. In order for you to start to visualize the details between those structural units, you have to take advantage of the phase differences between them, like when you use the phase contrast microscope. Another way to do that is by staining the cell with a dye. And we're going to look at some dyes and how we use them in biology to bring up contrast and therefore show uh, and increase the structural details within the cell. The last that we thing that we can use is to look at the edge effects, the diffraction, the refraction and reflection of light produced around the edge and how that can produce contrast and increase the details that you see in your sample. Next slide. So we have to look at sample preparation. If your sample is already colored naturally, like a plant cell, you do not need to modify it very much to be able to visualize it with light microscopy. Only transparent samples are that possess no color need to be treated appropriately. What do we do with that? We use staining dyes. We have hematoxylin, which is a dye that binds basic amino acids, side chains like the lysine, arginine and histidine and give them a blue hue. Eosin is another dye and that is able to bind to acidic side chains like in the aspartic acid and the glucamic acid. Together, the hematoxylin and eosin stain is able to give beautiful images where structures can be seen according to the charge of bases in the amino acids of the structures around those uh, tissues. Another stain that we use commonly in biology is the Gram stain. And the Gram stain is able to uh, stain bacterial cells, excuse me, is able to stain more specifically the bacterial cell wall to help us distinguish between bacteria that are Gram positive versus Gram negative. Next slide. A special kind of light microscope is called the fluorescence microscope. And the fluorescent microscope uses fluorescence uh, instead of or in addition to reflection and absorption to study property of cells. So when we think about fluorescence, a sample is illuminated with a light wave, which is going to allow for the excitation of the fluorescent molecules in that sample. The fluorescent light uh, that is emitted, usually of longer wave than the uh, wavelength of the illumination, it's then imaged through the microscope objective. In the next slide, we're going to look at two fluorescent molecules and how those fluorescent molecules uh, are able to fluoresce at different wavelengths and how we can use them in the lab to distinguish different molecules and different organelles within the cell. So in this image, what we have is the uh, absorption and emission spectra of two fluorescent dyes. The first one is fluorescein, or FITC, and the second one is phycoerythrin, or PE. So phycoerythrin is a protein versus fluorescein, which is a small molecule. In this image, which is uh, in the x-axis, it's showing the wavelength of light, starting about 300 nanometers, going all the way down to 900 nanometers. Also, in each of these images, you have an absorption spectra delineated, denial, uh, designi designated by a dotted line and you have an emission spectra designated by a uh, very thick full line. So in the top case, where we're looking at fluorescein, what we have is an emission spectra with the high peak in the 400 and 
80 to 490 uh, nanometer range. In the bottom area, we have the phycoerythrin molecule that has two um, absorption peaks. One absorption peak around the 480 to 900 to uh, 490 um, spectrum, and another one that is also a um, much uh, greater wavelength of 570. What I'm showing here also it's a light blue line which is the laser um, and this particular bright light laser it's fixed at a wavelength of 488. Notice that that 488 laser it is able to hit the absorption maximum of fluorescent in the first peak and the absorption and one of the absorption peaks of phycoerythrin. Now in the histogram on top in fluorescein, you see that the fluorescein molecule has an absorption uh, about 488, but the emission spectra begins to be shown from about 500. It peaks all the way in 530 to 540, and then it continues emitting until about 625. So you have a histogram showing the emission spectra. The emission maxima, which is the highest peak of the emission spectra, it is between 525 and 530. So in this image, you see that there is a light green area that it says 530 with a forward colon 30. That means that you can have a lens which has a, m a filter lens and that filter lens will allow light to be collected with 530 medium wavelength but it will also have a 30 nanometer range so light from 515 to 545 wavelength will be collected. Now look at the difference below it in the FICO erythrin emission spectra. Whereas the absorption spectra it's hitting the 488 nanometer wavelength, the emission spectra of FICO erythrin it's greater in the 550 to the 650 range. The highest peak, it's going to be found about 575. So two different fluorochromes stimulated with the same laser at 488 nanometers emit fluorescence with very different spectra. One of them with the peak around 525 and the other one with the peak around 575. So in biology we can use, uh, thanks to our chemists, we are able to now use many different fluorescent dyes that could be simulated with the same uh, wavelength of light, like the 488 laser, but then are able to emit a very broad spectrum of light uh, in the emission spectra. Next slide. So fluorescent microscopes also take advantage of filters that are going to allow the light to be spectrally separated according to wavelength. So in this image what we have are two different filters. One filter, the control filter on top, doesn't have any kind of spectral separation so as you can appreciate by the different colors of the rainbow going through everything that goes into this laser comes out but in this case when you're now looking at this particular filter in this case this red filter this red filter is going to absorb the um, wavelengths of light of violet blue and green but only then allow for the transmission 
of light of the red, orange and yellow spectrum. So no blue or green light is emitted. So therefore, um, spectral uh, filters that are going to allow us to spectrally separate light according to their wavelengths are going to be imperative to use to help us separate light in the fluorescent microscope. So what we have here is this image, is the image of a basic fluorescent microscope. It is not different from the light microscope in the sense that it has one source of light shown here in number one. That source of light in this particular scope, it is a light bulb and that light bulb is going to be emitting light of very different wavelengths. But the first thing that is going to happen is a barrier filter. And that barrier filter is going to have the capacity to block the passage of lights and only allow the passage of light from the blue spectrum, having wavelengths between 450 and 490 nanometers. So that first barrier filter is able to then uh, filter the light only allowing the desired blue light to go inside the filter, inside the microscope, excuse me, and then we're going to find a bean splitter mirror, or what we call also a dichroic mirror. The dichroic mirror, it has two capacities. One is that it only is able to allow light to pass if the wavelength of light is greater than 510 nanometers. So any light that has wavelengths lowest than 510 nanometers will be reflected and only light with wavelengths about 510 nanometers will be transmitted. Since the blue light has a wavelength of 450 to 490 nanometers, it will be reflected down and is, as you see here, directed 90 degrees into a condenser lens that is going to help now illuminate the sample. The sample is going to be illuminated, thinking is now about 488. Think about the diffitzy that we talk about that is absorbing at 488 nanometers and is emitting at wavelengths, is emitting fluorescence as a wavelength of 525 nanometers. So the sample has been stained it's able then to now fluoresce with the um, light now of 525 nanometers. The light is going to be passing again through the objective lens and the objective lens is going to direct it back to the bean splitter mirror, the dichroic mirror. Since now the new light that is coming it's of wavelengths greater than 510 nanometers, that light is going to be able to pass through as you can see, and as it passes through, that light is then able at the end to reach a second barrier filter. That second barrier filter is able then to cut out and filter unwarranted fluorescent signals, only allowing light to pass between the 520 and 516 nanometer uh, wavelengths. That then passes through the objective eyepiece which is going to have the second level of magnification and that green light eventually reaches the eye or the detector of the camera. Next slide. So for example what we have now are um, in this image are stem cells, embryonic stem cells that have been genetically engineered to uh, with constructs that are producing two different proteins. One of them, some of them are going to inherit the gene encoding the green fluorescent protein. And other ones are going to get another molecule called the cyan fluorescent protein. It is a mutant of the green fluorescent protein who's being engineered to emit light in the blue spectrum. So those genes have been introduced in a population of embryonic stem cells and as you can see in the image on the left, um, 
you can see all the cells in Brightfield. So you can appreciate all the cells that are available in your sample. On the right, now you can visualize the cells that are either fluorescent green because they have gained, uh, they have been transfected with the green fluorescent protein gene, or the ones which are blue, which have been transfected with the green flu uh, with the cyan fluorescent protein. What I want to call your attention in the bright field image are the four cells with the asterisk inside. Those did not get transfected with any genes and therefore are completely undetectable in the fluorescent microscope. So as you can see, the fluorescent microscope is also able to give you the capacity to look at cells which have been transfected by genes that allowed them to fluoresce. Next slide. For example, the fluorescent microscope could be used to visualize different organelles. In the image shown over here, we have a sample stained with three different molecules. We are identifying actin with the green fluorescent protein to be seen as green. We are identifying the mitochondria in red and we're identifying the nucleus by using a dye called DAPI, which is able to bind to nucleic acids. So um, the fluorescent microscope is able to acquire the emission spectra of all three of the dyes, the GFP for the acting, the um, red molecule for the mitochondria and the DAPI for the DNA in the nucleus and those images can then be taken by the microscope using filters that are going to allow the microscope to see only one color. Once those observations are done we have computer software that is going to allow us to do the overlay. So we can put the image in the green filter showing the acting cytoskeleton. We can put the image on top of that with the red mitochondria and we can put the image of the nucleus. And therefore you can get then the I image that you see to the right where you can appreciate the acting cytoskeleton as it crisscrosses the cell you can see where the mitochondria are distributed around the cell and then you can also appreciate the position of the nucleus. Next slide. So one thing that you can look also are the advantages of light microscopy and fluorescent microscopy. One thing is that light cells can be visualized by light microscopy. If the sample has its own fluorescence, that sample doesn't need any staining or fixation or sectioning, meaning that the sample doesn't have to be cut in order for you to see it. We already talked about that staining at contrast. No, excuse me. We already said the staining at contrast that is going to allow us to see better, but stains often kills the cells. So one thing that we can do is the fact that you can use specific molecules for fluorescent microscopy. So in the case of a live cell, you can engineer them just like we looked at those embryonic stem cells with the green fluorescent protein or the cyanine fluorescent protein molecule. So the cells which are alive will be able to produce that protein. Being the fact that you're producing a gene, you can put that gene under the control of a particular promoter. Could be the promoter that is going to be present, let's say, in liver cells, a promoter that is only present in cells of the intestine, etc., etc. So therefore now you can see whenever that promoter is active, you can then see the fluorescence present. And also you can uh, use molecules in which you have added the dye. For example, 
you can have antibody molecules. Those antibody molecules can be uh, covalently linked to the fluorescent dyes. And then you can use those antibody molecules to target structures within the cell. For example, you can have an antibody molecule that is going to be able to bind to proteins on the membrane of the cell, and you can see those cells now by looking at the fluorescence emitted through the microscope through the antibody bound to it. So those specific molecules can be used to quantify um, in fluorescent microscopy. You can look at live cells or you can look at fixed cells. Fixation can stabilize the cells so um, you they don't get decay and you can always get an accurate measurement. The last part that we won't have a chance to look at is the issue of confocal fluorescence in which you can use now a laser with a very specific wavelength to uh, look through the cell. And we're going to take time to look at that in the next lecture. So with that, I'll finish this lecture and upload it for you. And hopefully this will give us sufficient uh, material for discussion for Wednesday. Have a good day and we'll see you soon. Bye.